southern areas of Scotland. Um, it was at this time that one of our supporters came forward and said that they wanted to support, put forward um, an initiative to support our artists during this time. Now, the, this is a um, the support of artists throughout their career is uh, one of the main aims of the academy, and we disperse monies to artists at all stages of their careers um, every, annually. Um, so this would be an additional um, support initially for eight artists. Um, we put the call out with a very short turnaround because we realised that in order to assist people, we wanted them to get the money as quickly as possible. And um, we were surprised yet not shocked by the number of uh, applications that we received, which were in excess of 200. Um, some of these um, were incredibly harrowing to, to read as people talked about their emotional distress and um, and loss during this very early period of um, what would be you know a, a global uh, phenomenon really. Um, so um, once we got these applications together, we circulated them to the panel of academicians who would who would look at them to make a shortlist. And it was very it became very clear very quickly that um, it was only going to be a, a drop in the ocean for the need the necessity out there. We invited the uh, supporter in to be part of that judging panel and during the process of the judging he found some more money to raise that from eight awards to 12. So they, they were awarded in, in June July period last year and the artists were given the opportunity to just go ahead. We had hoped to begin to um, show these works from January, well starting in January and there was a plan for a large scale exhibition uh, in the academy in January, but of course, with the lockdown starting in Christmas, um, this was these plans were scuppered, um, typically by the pandemic. And um, so that some of those awards and results are online at the moment at our website uh, on the, in the Latitude exhibition, and we'll be hopefully showcasing other awards throughout the rest of this year. So that's just a little background on how we get to this stage of support for artists and of course Anthony and a number of the artists who are joining us today have been recipients of this award so um, enjoy this afternoon and I'll hand over to Anthony Shrad. Thank you. Thanks very much Colin. Um, it's really lovely to see everyone um, here so well see see you all <laughs> um, but it's it's nice to be in the same room um, ideologically with you all. So uh, one of the things that I was really interested in in my um, uh, project with the pandemic was sort of collective activity and collective um, creativity and, and how that works, because my work is very much about, I suppose, community-focused work. Um, and I will talk a little bit about more of that when, when it comes down to me, but what I had proposed is that, you know, if we can't actually show together, maybe we can at least talk um, with each other about some sort of... Um, shared collective experience and how we could maybe unpick and unravel some of the, the positives that come out of that. It's very easy, I suppose, for us to um, just talk about how terrible it is. And indeed, it's it's not great. <laughs> I'll, I'll be the first to admit that. Um, but there's something, I suppose, about the opportunity to rethink and to, to reflect on how we have um, grown or, or developed or reconsidered how, how our practices are functioning. Um, and so uh, what I initially was hoping would be sort of like a face-to-face -face part of the exhibition, a seminar discussion. We've then kind of translated to a Zoom experience. And I hope it'll give kind of an example of some of the works that the artists have been doing, but also maybe some of the shared experiences or some, some of the shared kind of um, understandings that we've been going through. Um, uh, so hopefully that's going to be um, uh, okay. I've, I've just got a note saying I keep freezing. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Maybe that's on. Okay, well, I will just keep going. So the format of today is we've got uh, two other artists and myself to talk about 15 minutes about some of the works that they've done and, and how they've adapted that works through, through, um, through the pandemic. And then we're going to come back together to talk about some of the collections and the collisions of our work um, and some of the similarities. Um, and uh, you all very welcome to ask questions. We have um, an amazing backstage person, Shireen, who's um, going to be keeping an eye on the chat and to be able to collating some of these questions. So if you do have a question, um, feel free to, to fire it through um, either on the chat or directly to Shireen, um, and we can, we can gather that together. Um, 
But the three artists are uh, Blair McLaughlin and Sarah Alonso. Um, and uh, we're going to talk one after another. Um, but first, alphabetically, I suppose we didn't think about this, but alphabetically, Sarah is, is going to present some of her work first. Um, and then I'll be Blair, and then followed by myself, followed by a group chat. So at this stage, I'd like to hand over to Sarah. And um, yes, so Sarah, how are you today? Fine, thank you very much. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, thanks, everybody, for, for being here. And um, uh, first of all, um, I'd like you to introduce you to the word uh, exhibited in, in latitude so you can understand um, um, how it was to produce it and how that affected to the studio. Okay, there we go. Hope everybody sees it properly. Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, I start saying that the work has um, a really, really personal approach, as it was a response, an act of grief uh, for the death of my father, and um, it was made in my flat in Glasgow because of the um, restrictions of the COVID nineteen. Um, Obviously, it was uh, really, um, really uh, difficult for me because my father uh, was in Spain. I was here, so it's a work that uh, talks about a confined about a confined space and trying to reach to to my father uh, because the distance and not being possible to travel and see my my relatives. Um, I have to process this grief um, at home. Um, after seven years of living in Scotland, I realized that I had no physical photographies of my father and only scans of his photographs uh, taken by him. So tangibility was uh, almost impossible. Uh, confinement and trying to reach my father, my family, my family and my father uh, from home was like a, in a fantasy and traveling and trying to, to travel through the world. So my home in Glasgow. Uh, I developed a connection with the space, knowing it's Sorry, Sarah. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. We're just seeing a black screen right now. Oh, um, I will. Just, mm, okay. Um, let's stop share and share again. Sorry. Can you see the content? Yes. Yes, we can say that. Ah, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. So, yeah, as I was saying, confinement, I uh, was really uh, trying to reach to my family from, from, from my home in Glasgow. And it was like a, like a fantasy, like traveling through the walls of my home. Um, I kind of developed a connection with the space with every single centimeter of the house. I was working in the same place. I was living in the same place. Um, there we go. Okay, now. Um, so this is part of the work that I developed. It's a, a cry for non-existent grave in 2020. And um, I, I was building this furniture in, in my own furniture. So it was a, a strong connection that I have with the work. My work at Padre Nuestro is a praying for the death of my father. I built a ceremonial space in my house for both of us, um, where I mix my domesticity with a magical home built in my present in, in the confined space. In this uh, case, for example, I was trying to reach to my father um, and through the walls of my, of my flat in Glasgow. And of course, in the... Um, in the, um, in the ceremony of the, of the funeral, of the cremation of the ashes in Spain, it was only allowed for the three of my siblings to go there and they had to be separated in between them. My mother was not able to, to attend and I was here. So that was kind of trying to reach every single way, um, way possible to my, to my parents. Um, as you see, the domesticity of the space, this was built in my home, I was kind of, fusing my furniture with the furniture that I was made in, in the, for this space. I diffuse my, my own images and those made with my father, by my father, because in, it was the only thing that I had 
I, I didn't have any other resource actually. Um, so I was kind of uh, lucky that I had um, the scans of his photographs uh, in my place. So um, I first uh, made them in the computer and fused both of us, his images and my images. And then uh, during, during a wee bit of time, I had the, the chance to, to use the Glasgow Print Studio. But in between, I had to make this space for both of us in, in my house. Um, as you see, the, the, it's a huge work. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, I don't really have a lot of space in the house. So it was a bit of anguish to, to have to live with the grief in, in the house as well. So um, uh, the grief was part of my everyday and it will remind me all the time about, about my father and about the process of, that I was going through. So it was um, uh, this needed tangibility that I was, um, I was having to need. Um, it, was, um, it was there, it was, it was present all, all day and 24 hours. Um, I was thinking about the village, like about my father. And for example, these storks are very pop um, popular in my parents' village. They are always there and it's something that is present in the village all the time. So um, I wanted to be present in, in, my, in my work and therefore in my house. So the memory of his was uh, invading the space of my house. As you can see, like uh, I kind of uh, felt the whole house made, um, made for him, not only the, the work that I was doing. So the limit between work and, and, and my own living, my normal living, let's say, um, it was, was almost erased. And then therefore it's, uh, this kind of created what I call the meta space, which was the situation of, uh, of trying to find myself making a space like a, for my father and I in my living space, trying to get to, to his space. So it was like a kind of a Russian dolls the situation where the border between the, the real life and, and the work is, is very blurred. It's, it's part of the, of the fantasy that I was trying to make for my father of us and us. So this is the chaotic situation I was having because I didn't have a lack of, um, of a studio. And this is when I told you about the mix between my, my fantasy and my, and my real life. And there were the cats and then the work and then the sofa, the dust, everything is, is all well mixed as, as, as you can see. Um, this was also like the whole chaos and mess that was in the living room of my house. Uh, was it kind of in the, in the novel, you know, in Metamorphosis? It was a bit like that, like suddenly it was growing and growing and growing and my real space was narrower and narrower and narrower. And the world will be like multiplying in every single space of my house. Uh, so the, that's what I call it, the word, the living creature. Suddenly it was not me making that space. That space was starting to be alive. So the, the fusion of my images with my father images, the fusion of my real present life with this kind of uh, temple and, and ceremonial space that I was trying to make, it was more and more uh, real. So it actually added to the, to the narrative that I was trying to, to tell through my work. And of course it was tangible because it, it was and it's still part of my, of my everyday. As you can see, uh, yeah, it was not a single space for, <laughs> for, um, for a plate for the dinner, <laughs> basically. And you can see the, the, the huge trail there for, for developing the cyanotypes, I don't know, mixed with coffee. And then suddenly the pot to, to melt the wax that I was using for, for covering the images. So the living creature was invading everywhere. Basically, the living room, the halls. Um, 
And for a while again, I was saying I was kind of lucky because I had a print studio. So I was combining the dark room of the GPAs with, um, with my home. The dark room of the GPAs was what I call like the confessional space because it, the, the red light, that, uh, that was a place where I could um, kind of get in contact with my father because, um, because also um, um, he used to uh, make photographies as a, as a aficionado let's say, and he was the one that taught me how to develop uh, analog photography. So it was like a moment of, uh, of intimacy for both of us. Uh, but at the same time, I was bringing that work home. So it was like a second reflection space. And so as you can see in these pictures, um, that was a bit the combination of both of us, of the work that I was doing in the print studio. Right now it's not possible, I'm really missing it. I'm missing that part of me that maybe it has uh, developed into something else, but I'm missing the, the studio a lot. It, it's affecting me in terms of like maybe I am getting more digital than normally because I am more like a, a tactile person, I guess. Um, but in, a, in some way I'm trying to, uh, to find another ways of expression as well. As you can see on the left is the print studio, on the right is my home. On the left is the print studio, on the right is my toilet. <laughs> on the left is the print studio, on the right again is my toilet. So I was combining both techniques like um, yeah, of the developing of the cyanotypes in the, in the print studio, but the tone of the cyanotypes in my home. The dark room in the print studio and the second step in my home. Uh, of course, the smell um, and the tangibility, it's not only um, uh, visual, it was also um, uh, sensorial through, through the smells that the, the materials were uh, having into my, in, into my space. Uh, that also was kind of invasive because suddenly it was the smell of, this, of the beeswax that was using for for um, covering the, um, the pieces of furniture that was mixed with the the smell of baked salmon and, or baked bread, of course, like everybody was baking bread in the, in the, in the lockdown. So it was a kind of weird smell. And also like the, the every single piece of materiality and of, of it was everywhere. Like the, the dust from polishing the furniture, uh, it was in the, in the whole house. Uh, you could find pieces of beeswax uh, in the in the dormitory. It was a, um, again something that really helped to feel like that my work was a living theater, and it was alive. It had a smell. It, it was visual, and it was tactile. So for me, it added again to the narrative of of um, of the process of grief being not a fantasy but real. As you can see is like the, the works, the coffee. Um, I use coffee and, and teas for toning the, the cyanotype. So that was really present. And it was in, in order to do this is in a, in a huge tray that I, I used to put it also in the living room. So it was uh, again, a very invasive of my space. Um, in order to, to, um, to make the paper photosensitive also, it was a bit of invasive and, um, and I have to leave it. Uh, I normally leave the paper photosensitizing during the night so because it doesn't have any exposed to the light. So the whole living room again was full of, of um, yellow papers. So again, as I'm saying, I think that my work has become a living artwork and it has become one more member of my domestic space. Um, it's not only my cat, it's, my, it's not only my partner and also my flight mate. And now it's uh, the work is with me right now <laughs> because we couldn't really um, uh, have it um, exhibited like physically. It's uh, still in this fantasy, fantastical world. It's, it still exists in the internet world, but it's not, um, it's not um, physical completed, I guess, I presume. But this is still part of my life every day. So you can see my 
uh, I hang my knickers there and then in the, my, the, my work is, is together. So it's still part of my life. Uh, I think my work, um, as I consider it living um, and it's part of a process, um, I think it, I somehow I need to, to put an end to it. So I, I have to take it out of the house. I have to, to keep going with the process of grief. So I think now I'm considering to move it uh, to Spain somehow, like um, doing this displacement of the work, the transportation of the work from Spain to, uh, sorry, from Glasgow to Spain, and maybe um, at my, my father's uh, village, I can just put an end to it by burning it, the, the work completely. So then it's kind of, um, it will belong to the fantastical fantasy world that it has to be. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Um, and I think I will hand over to Blair to continue with the, with the presentation. Thanks very much, Sarah. That was super. Yes. It was, I can see some people applauding from, <laughs> from afar in the silence. So we'll just uh, hand over to Blair, if that's OK. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye. OK. Hello. Can everyone see me? Yeah. yeah. Hi. Hi. OK, cool. So um, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to talk about four pieces that I made uh, after lockdown happened. Um, so firstly, I lived in Glasgow and I worked in Glasgow. Uh, I had a studio in Glasgow and I was supposed to have a show in 2021 uh, with my gallery based in Edinburgh. And I had another show lined up. So obviously these all got canceled. So I made the choice to move back to my parents I uh, gave up my studio. Uh, it was just too much of a risk to keep doing that. And during that time as well, my partner moved back home. So she moved back to China. I was supposed to go to China to work and continue my practice over there as well. So that all got thrown away. <laughs> so the last year has been a really odd year. I mean, for everyone as well. But uh, so I haven't seen my partner in over a year. And I'm sure she's watching just now, I think. She is, hello. And so, yeah, so I moved back to my parents and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna have to keep making work. All the work that I've made the last year, I'm just gonna have to put that to the sides, not worry about it. And so I just went straight in and yeah. So I produced this piece. This is, uh, so it's two meters, two meters 60 by one meter 60. So, I mean, it's much bigger than me. And this piece is titled, um, it's up here. It's a bullet never lies, it always tells the truth. And this was the first thing I produced after the uh, pandemic lockdown. Um, so this work is about something about America and like what was going on there. And I've always been interested in like riots and protests and like kind of negative side of like media and like what that portrays and how we feel about that. Um, and this was, this was alongside the Black Lives Matters movement. And I was thinking about all the people who were protesting against like lockdown and all these things and how everything just gets muddled up and it's totally confusing. Um, so this piece is kind of like aimed at the whole George Floyd thing and how people can lie about things and try and get away with it. And in the end, the bullet always tells the truth, like if someone sh you understand. Um, so I am a painter and I find it hard to talk about my work. So th th this work is like quite visceral and energetic and probably only took me like two days to produce this. After that, the main piece I think that I produced is is this piece here which is based off of a photo that i took of a screen and that's my partner and we were having a video call and this was probably around april or may time when i think most people were starting to get a bit sick of lockdown the first lockdown anyway and so this is just a, a little portrait that I produced 
and that's a little a little uh, sheep that I sent her. And I was thinking about this work and I was thinking about how everyone doesn't get to see their family, see their friends, be in contact with people. And first, and I had this, I remember walking back into my room and see my laptop just sitting there empty with no connection to another person. And that got me thinking about the Velasquez painting of Venus, the famous toilet one. Um, so I repositioned where the mirror is in that painting. I, put, I repositioned my laptop there and I put that screen there. And I think everyone can kind of connect to like missing being able to be in contact with people and like these intimate moments that we all now share with our friends and family and we've all kind of became used to it. Um, so this painting's also two meters 60 by one meter 60. It's very thinly painted. It's, I, I ground my paintings with rabbit skin glue and then I draw them out. My, my way of painting is I don't really think about it that much. I just try and go in, it's all about the painting and do that. And then this is what came out at the end. And I also had a piece here which is two meters by one meter 60. And this is actually an older painting that I produced in 2016. I really loved that painting, but it sat, it sat in my studio for four years and I never touched it. And then when I was moving back to my parents, this turned up and I re-stretched it and I just started working back into it. I wanted this painting to kind of touch on the negative emotions that we all deal with and we all kind of try and shy away from. And I think that's, that's the main purpose of my work is my paintings kind of push people into moments that they're a bit uncomfortable with and something that you don't want to deal with. I remember, I remember this piece got shown in my gallery and someone came up to me and said, why is your work so negative? And then I just, I was a bit took back by it. And I said to him, do you never feel afraid? And he's like, no, I just ignore that. And I thought that's ridiculous. We should all feel our emotions and deal with being afraid, being scared, being anxious. And I don't, I don't find this piece negative. Of course, being afraid is negative. I chose these four pieces along with some other work, which is, so after these works, this probably took me up till summer and I started producing work based on images that I found in my village, that I found of my village in the history. So this painting, this image here was of the Robert Burns Museum in Mauchland. And it was the grand opening, grand unveiling. And it kind of reminds me of an image of a funeral. That's a famous Scottish painting. And I just love this image. And I was thinking about my grandparents and my, my family and stuff. And I just decided to paint this image. Um, and then this is a, an image of an old shop. And I was just fascinated about these old little shops, which would have been great for everyone to have access to rather than your local Tesco's or co-op. During that time as well, I was also producing landscapes. So I produced this landscape. That's a local walk down near where I live. It's a gorge. And I probably visited that place over my life hundreds of times. But I think in the last year, I've, I've been there at least two or three times a week. So this is it in the height of summer. And recently I painted it in the middle of winter. So these are all two meters 60 by one meter 60. So I think what the award has done for me and it's given my, uh, the new perspective I think it's given me is, it's kind of taken me out of this rhythm of producing work for exhibitions and galleries and just try to forget about making work for that and just make work that I enjoy making and producing. Um, so I've took on another job of teaching online and that's kind of given me the income that I've needed alongside the award and other things to keep going. So recently what I've been doing since the award is continuing these ideas. So 
I was really interested in uh, industry and like old lost industry. So I produced uh, this work, which is based on people who went to Canada from Scotland. Um, so these are uh, loggers and these are like the, the giant redwood trees. Uh, this is actually, this is actually America. The one of uh, Canada is here. This is on the verge. So these are, I mean, it's not completely that would be Scottish people, but these are people who went to Canada. And, and I think I was thinking about the deforestation and like all these things. I, I, I think I was just focused on our world and how we can live and be and I think I think my work just speaks for itself mostly I can just blabber on about things that aren't relevant so yeah I think I might just leave it at that <laughs> <laughs> no problems thanks very much Blau um uh, I'm sure okay random random clapping of people as they go quiet quiet clapping <laughs> thank you <laughs> Um, I just to remind everyone if you if you if you do have any questions, please do pop them in the chat. One quick question that you can answer just right now, Blair, before we move on um, is where you never mentioned whereabouts um, is the village that you're in where your parents are from? It's the village of Mauckland in Mauckland. Ayrshire. Yeah. Super. Cool. So what I might do then is um, share uh, my screen and talk about my work really briefly, um, and then we can get to a more a bigger question. Um, so a lot of the work that I do is really based on a kind of a sense of physicality and, and I guess corporality, uh, which is a word, I looked it up, uh, but I often start the works that I do with this video, which is a work I made many, 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 many years ago, but I think it still speaks to something that I'm really interested in and, and sort of central cores about my work. Um, so right now the, um, I'm, I'm, I look like I'm upside down, but what I'm actually doing is I actually have my feet hooked on the underneath of the stairs and I'm walking up, uh, up the stairs, but I'm actually, I'm upside down. You could see the shirt pulling my, my the gravity pulling my shirt. But I show the clip for this pit, which is um, my uh, practice run. And as I was practicing to do this very silly walk, I wanted to make sure I didn't smack, break my head open. But I was practicing, I forgot to lock the doors in this really busy office, but because I forgot to lock the doors, the lady came down the stairs and so suddenly that became a much more interesting piece of work than I had ever thought it would be. And it kind of opened up for me this potential of what working with other people does and how working with other people changes my own understandings of work. And that's what I got really interested about. Um, and so um, I, I am very interested in, I guess, questions of, of physicality, but also um, collective activity. Um, I did originally change, I, sorry, I did originally study as a photographer. I, um, I kind of, this is some of the work that I originally did in Vancouver, but um, I would often make these works, but um, I would sort of make these photographs and I would show them to my tutors and they would go, oh yeah, that's nice, but it's a bit blurry here, or that's a bit cyan. And I'd go, ah, you get the point. You don't, it's okay. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be detailed, does it? Um, <laughs> and I suppose they were kind of looking at me going, maybe you, maybe you not really that interested in image making. And, and I think the reality is I wasn't very interested at that time in, in making images. And I kind of have a very uncomfortable relationship with images and image making. Um, and so what I remember is I remember having a conversation with my tutor at the time and she said, you know, Anthony, don't worry about if it's an image, if it's not, you know, make art. And I said, well, what does that mean? And she said, well, you know, art is the thing that challenges perceptual habits. And I quite liked that idea. And I kind of stick with that idea of what, and, and, and originally I sort of went off into the world to challenge perceptual habits and by making these sculptural forms, which are slightly risky, slightly dangerous, got me in a lot of trouble with health and safety regulations, which is an ongoing relationship that I have. Um, but, you know, and I, or I would make works like this, which are, are sort of sculptural things that um, have a tendency to blow up or destroy themselves, which would also get me in a lot of trouble with health and safety um, uh, regulations. But I suppose what I was I guess I was struggling with was I wasn't really sure what I was doing with objects or images. And I kind of went back to the thing that I was most interested in, which was my physicality. And, and I kind of went, did a lot of works that which were really about me climbing on things and jumping on things. So here's a performance I did of me in China with some lovely confused Chinese people. 
or here's me in Glasgow with some lovely confused Glaswegian people um, or, you know, various sort of things of trying to sort of explore the way that our bodies could be in space differently. Um, and I was very much kind of rejecting image making in, in favor of, of sort of more embodied physical understandings of the world. And a lot of my performative works, which were, which were involving other people were very much about kind of making things like this, which is a sign that's seven and a half meters long and going for a walk in downtown Glasgow and kind of knocking people down and getting trapped between signs and trying to find ways of negotiating people. But, you know, really kind of in, 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 in infusing my body into the, into the space of other people and then kind of making sure that that interface happened and what I was kind of suppose I was realizing was that I wasn't really interested in making physical objects that sign wasn't the art the art was the physical interpersonal relationship relational things that were happening and that was the exciting challenge of perceptual habits that I was really interested in and so a lot of my work kind of went on to do these very physical interactive um social work so this was a work I did in London with part of this um uh, South London gallery where they sort of asked me to develop a piece of work between two housing estates which were kind of developing these emergent gang cultures um, and and what I did was I proposed an interstate football match but it was literally interstate there was one goal on one housing estate and there was another goal on another housing estate and it was a 35 a side match across roads through people's gardens through parking lots and this kind of interest in collectivity and community and, and physicality has always been a really central part of my work so when I kind of proposed, uh, when I saw the call for the pandemic, I was like, yes, I want to do that. I'm going to go back and talk about uh, um, the, 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 the physicality and, and interconnectivity between people. And this is the, the, what I have on, on the screen was, was very much about what I'd proposed to do originally, which was very much about looking at how, how can cultural work when we can't be together? You know, how do we do that? What does that mean when we can't be together? How can we make these shared physical experiences when we can't physically be together, how does that work? And so I was really interested in, in finding out if I could make that happen. And it was a kind of a research-based proposal to explore what that was. And what I initially proposed to do was that my back garden was going to be a microcosm of this COVID world. And I was going to create these physical works that kind of interfaced whether I was showing pictures between people or we were singing to each other or we were playing games or something that was sort of developing these interfaces between people in this back garden as a microcosm. It didn't work uh, because people were really hesitant to contact other people. And I totally get that. That's absolutely fair. And so what I had proposed to do really rapidly shifted and changed and in the early stages of the research for this work, what I ended up doing was then maybe kind of reflecting on, on how possibly I could make that in a different way. But through the way that I think is really physically. So what I, I, I did was um, try to sort of make sense of my lockdown world through my body in the same way that I made sense climbing on lampposts and doing these sorts of things. So even though I was still working, it was very much trying to stopping and going, I am trapped in this space. How can I physically be in this space differently? And so I've developed these series of small performances or activities, which were kind of trying to find ways to literally experience my world differently, literally look beyond my physical spaces to kind of find ways that I could be in those, those worlds differently. Um, and again, going back to that physicality, right? And try to sort of find finding my sense of physicality. Um, and finding my sense of, of, of how my body is literally contained by this world. There's a lot of me being upside down, really, fundamentally, that's what it is, and jamming myself into silly positions. Um, and it really is sort of about the sort of work-life balance that I was trying to find, like, how do I kind of create this balance between these ideas? But there was no kind of collectivity, and I was really kind of struggling with this collectivity. So what I proposed to do as part of the sort of development for the pandemic was that I developed um, a series of, of zines, and, and just, a, just, I forgot to put it in the chat, but I'll copy those into the, into the, 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 the chat just after I finish here. But what I did was develop um, a, a call out with two other artists, Matthew and, and Alice, where we basically picked a theme and then we just invited people to submit anything. And that was the deal. The deal was that there was no limitation. You could have been 
a two-year-old drawing or you could have been someone else who was a professional you could be there was no criteria it was just the only criteria was respond to these singular words um rhyme stacked or absence and they kind of happen and so people of various different things so people submitted um poems or illustrations that they were doing or some photographs that they were doing or collages and all of these works were very much about kind of going here's how individuals are responding to the particular context and here's how they're how we're, we're kind of providing a forum with which to show this collective thinking again i'll put the links on the chat but i will what i was really interested in doing within a lot of these works was in my own work and my own responses um to these um it was sort of thinking about my physicality and, and in the process I was making these collages of, of my own physicality and my body trapped in space. But in doing them, I was sort of doing these cutouts in the digital world where I was sort of sitting there and cutting myself out from these little images that I've done. And then I kind of looked at these images and going, actually, those are quite interesting. I don't know where those are coming from. And in the process of me making these works for the collective zine, I was ended up making these images which I actually for the first time in my life felt comfortable with and I suppose my response to the sort of positivity of, of, of making a lot of these works was that I was becoming comfortable with an image again in the way that I'd never been before and, and I suppose I'd never expected the process of image making to return to my practice which has fundamentally been about physicality and collectivity um, but that makes sense when you know Blair and Sarah have both talked about the limitations. You know, our limitations were the fact that we couldn't, and so we had to rely on the things that we did have. Um, and so this has been a kind of incredibly interesting process for me, which is that instead of being focused outward, which is what I've normally been doing, it's very much about being looking um, inward. Um, and so I'm just going to stop sharing there. And what I also will do is quickly share um, the links to. Um, uh the chat uh, to everyone so that later on you can have a look at those um but yes the idea is is that fundamentally when we do get back to the sort of proposal to, to the actual physical zine to the physical spaces um we would love to be able to do a continuous zine where people can continue to add and that collect collectivity can be part of it um and so now's the part where we kind of um I stopped talking and we, we turned to some of the questions um, between both Sarah and Blair and I. Um, thank you, I see Kate clapping there. That's very kind of you. <laughs> it's very weird to operate in silence here. Uh, but I wonder if I could invite uh, Shireen to pin both Sarah and Blair and myself and we could all turn our microphones on and um, have a more of a, um, a collective chat, I suppose, about uh, how we, um, have adapted a lot of our work. Um, there's one thing I, I thought was really quite interesting is that we, um, in some ways, all of us have gone and looked back on older work. Um, you know, Sarah, with the works that your father has made or Blair, previous stuff that you've done, and I've kind of gone back to different processes. And do you think that's a process of um, being having no other option? Or do you think the kind of necessity of reflection made you do that? what made you, I suppose, and I suppose each one of us have different reasons, but I never expected that I, I thought I would try and use a lot of this time to make new things rather than kind of looking at older stuff. Do you have any kind of thoughts on that, either Sarah or Blair? Well, in my case, uh, I did have to look back because uh, it was the only thing that I had. So it, it is, um, um, is, and I had to go through a process. So I, first you have to reflect, then do, and then you will get somewhere else. So I think it came like a natural to the narrative. Um, um, I'm personally, I'm a person that really like uh, to work with archive uh, mm -hmm. photographs and things that I find. So everything that you find has a past. So um, yeah, for me, it's it, it came natural to me in that way. Mm -hmm. But it, in terms of reflection, obviously, yeah, 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 yeah. It was more reflected, more, I pay much, much more attention to the reflected times than mm -hmm. uh, normally I will, I like to do things very spont spontaneously. Yeah. And I believe you, like, I hate when it takes me a long time. I don't know, pre-making is about, you know, just bleh, vomiting, I was yeah. say, and making marks and that's it. And this was more like thoughtful. In, yeah. mm -hmm. Did you find that as well, Blair, or was it more kind uh, of a... 
I think, yeah, I think part of it was because of what happened. Like, I had to move everything back. Well, I didn't have space to store it, so I had to, like, physically roll everything up. So I kind of look at everything again and, like, look at older things. And uh, I think it's always part of my process anyway to look back and just kind of reflect, but not, not so far back as to, like, look at the history of my village and stuff. That was, like, another thing, you know. So yeah. and, like, the history of how we came to here and... I mean, the history of pandemics, like the Spanish flu, I looked in it all that kind of thing. And yeah, it's just, I think it's a good thing, you know. Yeah. Back to have a better future, maybe. I know. I suppose, we, I, I suppose in some ways that's a kind of positive that, that we, we have that time or that we were forced to have that time to reflect. Um, but I wonder, like, do we... <laughs> Is it, was it too much? Like sometimes, I don't know if you felt the same way, there was just too much reflection. I was just like, I just want to do something, <laughs> like yeah. move forward with it all. Yeah. Um, trying, trying to find time when, you know, living with your parents and there's kids and stuff running about that you don't, aren't your kids and whatnot. It's like, it's, it's there's a lot of other distractions that like, you know, I think me as an artist, I just spent all my time in my studio by myself. I like closed the door. And that was it. Like nothing distracted me. Like didn't have yeah. my phone. I just like I would have music and something to eat, and that would be it. And spend the whole day there, no distractions. But then now that it's like a constant distraction, you just get used to it. So I think it's a good way to. It's good yeah. to get past that because before, like, if someone had to phone me, I'd be like, I couldn't do anything until they like that phone call was over, even if it was like four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. So. Sarah, is your house still a distraction? My, no, I mean, I do also, I do work as, also as a freelance, so I'm, I'm actually super, um, super used to work at home and home being part of my normal process. Um, you deal with that. I think every single noise is part of, of your process as well. In my case, I don't, I do really need to focus for thinking yeah. always, but not for making, yeah. making comes. And also if you go to Glasgow Print Studios, I love actually being yeah. surrounded by people because that makes me work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. nobody is looking at you, but you feel like you have to produce yeah. somehow. So um, I find it I found it really difficult because my because my practice is about other people. Like, you know, like the other people were really important to me normally. And suddenly it was just my partner who was just going insane, just gonna leave me leave me the alone. Like go and work on your own. And and I found that really until I started doing the zine where I was kind of like starting to talk to other people because I needed that I needed the other people as opposed to kind of then just being by myself um, mm. yeah it is more difficult to I, I think it's more difficult to produce uh, work uh, in my case by being alone it's true I kind of need an input like yeah. even a glaze or somebody looking at it or something yeah. um feel much more confident actually so yeah. it's like fighting your own demons, yeah. impo imposter syndrome. All the, <laughs> all the time, all the time. <laughs> and you have no one to talk to. So it's... Yeah, the echo chamber becomes quite massive when you don't have anyone else. To, and, I, and I wonder if, if, if either of uh, you, know, how, how you how either of us have dealt with that, like when you just when you don't have someone else to bounce those ideas off or, or that kind of process, if that's. I never really done that. I never really bounced my ideas off anyone. I just, I was in my own world. So, yeah. uh, uh, That's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> there's some questions that are coming through that it would be good to ask. And some of them are directly for, for either yourself. And it, ah. uh, for both the first one, Sarah, and it was an interesting question. Uh, wondering about the burning of the work as a conclusion, which, by the way, I love this idea personally. <laughs> but the question is, what would wh why not do this in Scotland so that there's the ashes that travel? Mm, I think uh, because I all the time I was trying to do it was the tangibility of the work, you know, like tangible, tangible, tangible. I have to make this uh, this uh, space for my father and I tangible. I think actually uh, bringing it to uh, like that, that physicality, bringing it to my 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 parents' village, and then he's. Um, we only have his uh, assets, you yeah. know, we don't have anything else. So um, it's a kind of a, also an act of the cremation of something physical, yeah. Yeah. you know? So I think I, it, it will go with me as well. So I am in that place and, and it needs my presence in, in the place, I think. Yeah. We also, 
uh, have some, uh, you know, family land and stuff like that. Yeah. So it, it will also be great to do it um, in a more personal approach yeah. in those lands. Yeah. Uh, where places that were common for my father and I, I guess. Yeah, that mm. makes sense. And it's interesting, kind of slightly relates that kind of almost catharsis in some ways yeah. of that kind of relates to um, the next question, which was, which was Blair. Um, it says, in your work, um, Afraid, I really connect with the seemingly frenetic, abrasive painting approach, uh, set aside the composition. Do you find that primal instinct and cathartic is an important element for your process? Do you think? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think so. Like, uh... Uh, I've always like just produced work and never really like not not I didn't think about it I just like tried to do it and focus on just the painting and not worry about anything else that was going on around me or in my head and just like I'd spend hours just painting and then in the end I'd have something and then I'd look at it like maybe the next day or like the following week or something so yeah I think yeah the kind of cathartic element of it is true yeah because I think the I'm afraid piece was based on an image that I saw in I think it was Times magazine of like Donald Trump being elected not to like talk about mm -hmm. him but it's like looking down from the uh, congressional uh, the place where there was the protest riot thing and someone get killed so like that that image and then I saw this other sign of like someone holding a sign just saying I'm afraid they were at like some protest somewhere else and it was just like a big cardboard sign it said I am afraid and I thought that was the best sign I'd ever seen ever seen of just like everyone's like oh I want this I want that I want this I think this I think that and there's someone just like oh I'm afraid and I thought that was just like how I felt about everything because most of the things like we learn about I, I, I see anyway is like I'm an outsider viewer on it like I have no I have no like personal like feeling in among it it's more like something that if I was there I would have an opinion on it and I would want the right thing but like when I'm looking well, from the outside, it's so hard to like judge things and mm. like to really know what happened, especially the way media can portray things. So, mm. yeah. Uh, and I was just, yeah, the whole process of like being scared of something and like realizing something's scary and like getting over that. I think that I do do that maybe in my painting, but yeah. I don't, I'm not really aware of it somehow. Yeah. I'm usually really, I found the pandemic quite an interesting sight because I'm usually really not afraid of anything, but I remember this doesn't relate to work, but but I don't know if you guys had this similar experience. I remember um, near the beginning of the pandemic, maybe it was April or May, someone suggested I read the book Station Eleven, which is about a global pandemic, and it's a fr it's a fiction account of a global pandemic. And I couldn't read it; it was petrifying to me. It was like I've read it since when I was much more kind. But there was a time I don't know if you felt that way, where your where your emotions were just at a really heightened raw level. And I don't know whether you felt that being manifest in your work. Like, did you find that that kind of heightened sensitivity to things, or were you kind of okay with it? Yeah, I think I think I started painting things that weren't so uh, morbid or depressing. Uh, I started doing the landscapes and stuff because I couldn't. I mm -hmm. didn't didn't. I think when I'm happy, when I'm happy, I like paint all the kind of negative things. But when I'm negative, I maybe paint the like kind of the happier more. Or it's simply like the happy side. You know. so. What about you, Sarah? Well, I did have a very sensitive um, situation and in introspective, obviously. Course, it, yeah. So it was like, um, um, I am a very, in a normal situation, I'm a very normal, I mean, I'm a very funny person, you know, I'm, I'm kind of uh, satirical as mm -hmm. well, you know, and I got like super dark suddenly. Um, so I do think that now is the time of coming out from that feeling mm -hmm. of uh, immersive um, spirit to something more collective, I guess, or more yeah. like noticing the outside, noticing that things can be better or they are being better and noticing the social part as well. Yeah. Like, um, oh, there are people in the street. Oh, yeah. uh, we can actually have that uh, connection again. So I think it's, time for that introvertive, um, introspective um, spirit to, to be a bit more open now, yeah. I guess. So I'm... Um, I yeah. very much agree with that. And it's interesting, there's, there's the next question, Claude Williamson says, um, as an artist, do you feel the pandemic has either altered or changed your approach to either welcoming or disregarding responsibility in a social or political sense? And, and I think that kind of, that kind of relates to that question, that, or that point you were just making this, Sarah, about 
now that we're kind of going towards changing as we kind of open up, kind of become mm. more collective, do you think that your practice will address those things more or less? Or do you think your practice will just go straight back to normal? What do you think? In my case, I think I'm going to go to a, to a very uh, happy fantasy moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure. I'm not ready yet to analyze more problems of the world in yeah. our, our social responsibility. I think um, despite of, of, yeah, obviously, uh, being political, Brexit, et cetera, um, is there. But I think um, not right now, yeah. but uh, it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Bao, do you feel that you would be more social or political responsible? Yeah, uh, I struggle with that one because I, 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 I don't see how my work has any like responsibility towards all those things. Like, I think I think I can like share a view on it, but like, I, like maybe, I don't know if I think of like Picasso's uh, Guernica, like something like that, like makes a comment particularly about like the war that was going on at the time. It was like completely anti-war. Like I think my work can maybe have voice of opinions of like, this is bad, this is bad, this is this, like obviously we shouldn't, people shouldn't be doing this and people that are doing it sh shouldn't really be doing it. Uh, I struggle to like see how my paint, me painting in my studio can help people. So I don't know, I, I have a bit of a conflict with that. So yeah, okay. yeah, I've always, yeah. Kinda, you know, it's, it's hard to like justify me painting something, how that's going to help someone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. it's just art as everyone yeah. keeps saying. <laughs> Just start. Yeah. Um, I'm, con I'm conscious of time and, 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 and aware that some people, but there's a really th kind of an interesting question that Rachel asks, um, which is that uh, what helped with adapting your practice to working from home as a final year student? I'm finding, still finding it struggling to make art at home, particularly work that's so physical, similar to Sarah or Blair's. It's difficult to get in the headspace of making it. Before I kind of throw that to you guys, I, I, I suppose I kind of want to add to that. Maybe what is slightly different for myself in terms of making is I've never had a studio. I've never, ever had a space. And, and I, that was a really conscious choice for me because I didn't need a space to make stuff because I'd never made stuff before. You know, I wasn't interested in the object or that it was very much about being out. So in some ways, suddenly having a space, i.e. my home, that became my working space, that kind of became a studio. How did it feel, I suppose, to you guys in terms of did you feel you needed to adapt the space for the work or did you adapt the work for the space? Do you know what I mean? Hmm. In my case, I go more like I adapt the, the work to the space I have. I've always like, again, I do have always troubles with the, with the space and, and place. Somehow <laughs> I can I cannot really, uh, the, the good thing is like uh, with the years I have, uh, I have learned how to, to, ha to be multitask or multi-technical. Um, I'm not a person that only focuses in one technique and that's it. I like to mix. Um, so suddenly it can be digital and digital is good. Or it can be interactive and interactive is good. It can be physical, as you said. I don't know, you can go and do a performance in the soap, in the corner. So um, you don't really, I think uh, the work is the one that limits um, your space somehow. If you want to express something and you find a manner of, in my case, I say again, I, I don't really have one technique, like painting and that's it, or mm. or etching and that's it, you know. I like the the talk, the conversation that the work has with you, and that can be found everywhere. Yeah. What about yourself, Ryan? Yeah, Rachel, I think like uh, just you just have to do it. Like maybe maybe set set like if you can't find the time, just I don't know. Just try and force yourself to do it maybe the first time and then the next time it's easier. But I think, yeah, just, I mean, I remember one time I went out to a pub with like a group of friends and someone said something to me and it really annoyed me. And I think almost just despite that person, I, was, I like just left the pub cycle to my studio and worked. But like I've for four or five years, I've had a studio, but before that I never had a studio. I used to just paint where I could and I don't know, like, even if you're not painting or drawing or if you're like, like you said, Anthony, you're just making work in, in your home, in your head, or like it's ideas, like just writing it down, drawing it down, anything, just try and do it or like convince yourself not to do it. Say, like, I'm not going to do it and just keep telling yourself you're not going to do it. And then maybe you will do it. So, yeah. Fight yourself. <laughs> Fight yourself. <laughs> I think that's the, that's the one thing as artists we always do. We give ourselves little tricks 
tricks to make us work. I don't know if you've, you've found this or, or, or you know, yeah, the, 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 the ways you trick yourself into doing the things yeah. you don't want to do. And, you know, maybe that's because we're precarious artists. We've all, we've all had to, we've all had to do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's just one last question before uh, we sort of start to, to, to wrap up, if no one else has any other things to say, but um, there was something about the physical, um, I suppose this is directly to me. Um, have you found, but open for anyone, have you found um, your interest in your own physicality now connected, reflected with wider societies, increased awareness of their own physicality through this collective trauma? Um, I have definitely noticed my, I, what I have noticed in myself is my, um, my very much awareness of other bodies. Like that's become hyper physical to me, very, very much so. And, and I, I, I keep saying this and I, and I think I really truly feel this is, and I, I'm gonna be that people that hugs people on the street. Like I am desperate for physical contact, but that's maybe not me. Maybe that's just sort of says more about me. <laughs> um, but I suppose, I mean, just to kind of, to draw some of these, these things together uh, and to sort of conclude on some of them, I, I suppose, do you, to, as a last question, are there any elements, say tomorrow we, we go quote unquote back to normal, are there elements of your practice that you think have permanently changed or things that you would like to, ch to try more of as you go forward or differently? Well, um, I think uh, I need to escape first of all, over this house. <laughs> I think I'm not gonna, I don't know, I think I'm gonna make more, um, per, I don't know, I used to walk and do per, pilgrimage and art and pilgrimage at the same time. Like in Camino Santiago, I did in Japan, I, I did a, a huge walk. I like to do movement and then I reflect on the movement and I do work. So uh, yeah, I think I, I need that. I need like a space, a time out of the space. And I have learned that the, the house, again, that, that you can make it work everywhere, that you can make work absolutely everywhere. But at the same time, I kind of need to escape a bit. Yeah. Hmm. Absolutely fair. Yeah, but how about yourself, Leo? <laughs> yeah, I think I'd just try and see my girlfriend again. Um, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, I think I think maybe just a more positive attitude about the things that you maybe take for granted. Like I don't really think my pra my practice. You, I think if I try to think about my practice too much, it always ends up in like me making really bad work. So I just don't think about it. But I think the positive thing would be just being be able to take everything for granted again. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much all for for joining us, and thank you very much to Sarah and Blair for sharing. Uh, your work with us that's been really helpful and useful um, and very much thank you to uh, Shireen who is secretly and, and uh, perfectly kind of backstage managed all of us and filtered some of those questions in um, but uh, do stick around and keep in a track on when the pandemic exhibition will actually go forward um, who knows in physical but we hope to see you there in person <laughs> uh, uh, but otherwise uh, it was lovely to to spend some time with you this afternoon and to share some stories so yeah uh, thank yeah. you on behalf of the RAC to our three speakers Anthony, Sarah and Blair and it's been so interesting hearing your experiences and don't forget that Blair and Sarah's work is on show on the RSE online exhibition Latitudes until the uh, 17th of March I think it is um, so do take a look at that if you haven't seen it already. And yes, we look forward to seeing all the pandemic winners at some point in the near future. <laughs>